Thank you for watching Libertarian Counterpoint, brought to you courtesy of COVID-19 from James House via video conference. So with us today is a recurring guest, Jason McPhee. Jason, a couple weeks ago we were talking about um, we were talking about quarantines and that kind of libertarian view of quarantines, and now it's kind of happened in reality. So what is, has anything changed kind of for your view on that? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, one of the uh, perspectives you brought up last time that, uh, uh, you know, gave me a little bit of pause uh, in the issue was, can we even trust the information that's coming to us? And I, I think at least it's, uh, you know, it, it's clearly a crisis that we're having, you know, the exact level of crisis is hard to know, especially since the initial information came out of China. But clearly, there's severe effects going on in different uh, different places of the world, places like Italy and such. But it's very hard to even quantify since a lot of people who may have it aren't even being tested. So, uh, but but even all that being said, you know, we are sort of in that quarantine world at this point. But it's funny, when we first started talking about it, I imagined it would be people who were sick that would be being quarantined, not everybody. <laughs> Yeah, that's what kind of the feeling was. Do we have the right to take somebody who's sick and kind of lock them away in their house or in a hotel room or something? But now it's they've kind of quarantined essentially most of society except for essential workers, and that's a strange list of essential workers. In my house, we my uh, my my daughter she's working crazy hours down at Home Depot, but my daughter-in-law is not working. She's a food service worker at the airport, and so she's not working at all. And so there's got this kind of strange um, dichotomy of what's going on. And as a gig worker, my Amazon deliveries, you'd think they'd be busy, but they're not. It's a very strange world that we're kind of living in now. Yeah, I, I did hear that Amazon is is getting ready to do some massive hiring. And that may be because of the shift of the economy towards deliveries might be, uh, you know, what everybody's anticipating. But it's, it's still... Uh, like you said, it's it's really hard to figure out what's going on. Lots of people every day are being laid off from positions because businesses are being put in sort of an untenable position where they're not really being told how long this is going to last. And they're being told they may have liabilities to cover uh, pay of workers who won't be there producing anything. Uh, the government's saying short term, they're going to give some relief to these businesses. But, you know, when you don't really have a, a good projection for the long term, I think a lot of businesses are just doing the safe thing and and for themselves and cutting, uh, you know, putting workers on furlough. Well, yeah, you can't go into a huge debt if you're not sure you're going to have income in, in a couple months. You know, it's one thing if you know, OK, it's a two month thing and we'll be back on the road. We can get through. But if you don't know if it's two months, you know, one month, two months or six months, it's very hard to plan. And most of these businesses aren't huge businesses. They don't have stocks of cash or stocks they can sell or, or, or investment bankers they can turn to. They're just kind of like you and me trying to get by. And at the moment, they don't have any income. And so it's very difficult time for these a lot of these businesses. And it's sad. I, I think this really uh, hits at the, the problem of so many people in society really not having a good idea of how the economy actually works. So, you know, a lot of people are comfortable in trusting with government that government's going to be able to resolve this issue with an edict or something in, in a few weeks. But uh, my big concern is that, you know, uh, once government pulls the cork on this thing, and, and it already has, and if, it, if, if, it, if jobs continue to flow, um, you know, uh, into down the drain, essentially, for the next few weeks, there may not be jobs for a lot of people when they finally are ready to come back. You know, maybe maybe some businesses have lost their leases. Maybe some, you know, people uh, simply had a lot of debt and they weren't able to deal with it during the time they were down. So it's it's really I think we're going into um, very uh, challenging times. Well, I know you brought up a lot of debt and speaking of a lot of debt, how is the U.S. debt going to help, how going to have going forward? You know, we're going to go into even more debt trying to deal with this. And we're already, what, $22 trillion in debt in just the federal government? Yeah, I think uh, we're we're close to, we were close to two, uh, $22 trillion, I believe, going into uh, this year. And now that's, uh, you know, 
seems to be expanding by the day. You know, the bailout packages that they're talking about are in the trillions. And, you know, with literally no in, uh, end in sight. So, you know, just to give you a sense, the gross domestic product for the country, um, that's, uh, or excuse me, uh, that, that is around uh, close to 22 uh, trillion rather, but it's the debt is actually a little bit, um, <clears throat> is a little bit higher than that. That's around 23 going into all this, excuse me. And then when you, uh, when you start adding more debt onto that, uh, those uh, debt to GDP ratios uh, start becoming well over a hundred percent. And, um, you know, just to give you a sense, uh, uh, a lot of economists talk about the tipping points of when an economy starts to become hurt by this uh, debt to GDP ratio is anywhere between 77% and 90%. I think, um, you know, if you just do a Google search online, you'll find that a lot of places are saying that tipping point is around 77%. And, um, you know, going into this year, in fact, I, I have a little bit of a graphic I'll show you on this. So if you look at this graphic, you can see our historical, this is for, by the way, from the Congressional Budget Office, and so you can see historically, um, we've had fairly low debt to GDP. And so, you know, when the country was founded, there was some debt from a war. So you can see that at the beginning of the graph. And then it sort of goes down. And then we get a huge spike around the Civil War. That goes up. And then after the war, you know, uh, government is relatively small when it's not in war in those times. And so it starts to trail down again. And we hit World War II or World War I, rather, and it spikes up again. But after World War I, it never completely gets down to those lower levels because we're starting to grow government. And then we have the Great Depression. And that sets sort of a new floor right before this big spike that you see right here. And that's World War II. And then so World War II comes in. And eventually that drops back down to, but not near, that's actually, it's dropping down to near the levels of mm -hmm. the spike of World War I. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of like the new floor at this point. And a lot of that is because of the growth of government from the New Deal programs. And yeah, we're, 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 down, Jason. No, we're only reading your okay. time. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> when we finally get over to here, though, and this is around when we had the housing crisis right here when we wind up around 2008. So this shoots up. And then we are trailing up this way. And it, this bar represents about 2017, 2019, right in there. And essentially, this, this growth curve is what the CBO uh, believes would happen if we didn't do anything to address this, if we just kept on a business as usual. Well, at this point, we're starting to become way up here, even though we're still near that line. So essentially, we've, we're, we're dramatically increasing at this point to the, um, we're dramatically increasing our debt to GDP ratio due to this crisis. And we appear to be not only just throwing more money into it, but becoming less productive because we're being told not to work and to stay at home. And um, uh, Goldman Sachs just projected too that our second quarter GDP, that's our gross domestic product, is gonna be down 24%. That's a huge hit to the economy. So that changes that ratio. Essentially, it pushes it up to those World War II levels already, you know, is where we're at on that spike. And and, and we don't really have an end in sight at this at this point. So it, it, we're getting into scary levels. Yeah, no, I read an article yesterday where someone's talking about um, printing a trillion dollar coin. Ah, They're literally just want to print a trillion dollar coin and, and then, you know, kind of use that as money. It's yeah, Krugman had a plan, uh, I think, during the Obama administration, <laughs> when he wanted there to be more spending, and I think there was a Republican Congress, and he wasn't likely to get it, he tried to float the idea to Obama to just go through the mint and print a trillion dollar coin, because apparently if you did that, you didn't have to get Congress's approval. But yeah. even Obama thought that was that was a, uh, a leap too far and didn't go along with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, what is that? That. Uh... Democrat Congress lady out of Minnesota to to lead. I forget her name. I always confuse her name with the football player, and uh, a keep to lead, and that's not her name. And so I don't want to, and I don't want to butcher her name because you know you want to be more respectful than that. But I can't. Her name always escapes me. But she she was, came up with that idea, and oddly enough, it, there was some receptiveness to that. 
essentially printing printing three trillion dollars worth of coins, three trillion dollar coins. And the argument was, well, Trump might go for it because then he get to take a picture in front of these trillion dollar coins and say, oh, they're lovely coins. They're the best coins. And you know how Trump goes with those kind of things. And, you know, give Trump a visual win and you can get him to do almost anything. What, well, what would you well, yeah, and, and, and this is the thing that's actually concerning, you know, when we have somebody in the White House, it's not a Democrat, but he's also not somebody who's afraid to put the pedal to the metal in spending, <laughs> I guess, and, uh, and cutting interest rates. And so uh, these are, are some of the concerns we should all have is that, uh, you know, and, and, and even, even to exacerbate the situation, it's an election year. So everybody wants to look like they're doing something. And that means, you know, potentially putting us into an awful lot of debt uh, without really being sure that we're going to get a lot out of it. Yeah, it's hard. It's And it's so hard to know. There's so much uncertainty right now. Well, speaking about uncertainty, um, the California government, you know, Newsom's actually order about closing businesses and stuff wasn't actually as strong as people were uh, originally thought it was. But local governments, especially in San Francisco and San Jose, are taking hard lines on businesses and, and people going about their daily lives. You know, is that actually constitutional? Is that actually legal to shut these businesses down and tell people they can't gather in groups of more than five or 10 or whatever it happens to be today? Well, that was one of the things uh, <clears throat> I had seen in an article uh, recently. Uh, I'm trying to remember where that, uh, what that, oh, it was from a, a, a online paper called the California Globe. And there was an attorney talking about that just a couple of days ago. So. Uh, viewers could go look that up if they want. He had a pretty in-depth discussion about all of the legality of this. I guess the guy is a constitutional lawyer, uh, so he is up on a lot of this stuff. And he pointed out a few things that struck me. And one is that if there's a takings by government in a crisis that, uh, you know, in some cases they would, uh, you know, still have to pay businesses uh, for that. In, in in this particular case, uh, the government has told uh, businesses that are out there that they need to shut down because they're non-essential. And then he's telling people that they can't go to those businesses as well. And the business itself may not actually be the problem. It's just that it's been labeled as non-essential. So in, in a way, it's almost like a takings. And, and, you know, I wonder if that's something where, you know, businesses you know, could potentially try to challenge that if they felt they were being hurt. It's probably a hard thing to do in a crisis like this, but um, it's one of those things where uh, they they certainly are potentially, you know, uh, have the potential to lose their livelihoods in this. Um, and it's, it's a really odd thing because like we said near the beginning of the program, this is something where we're quarantining healthy people, not just people who are spreading a virus so it's it's really uh it's really uh going to be a challenging time trying to untangle all this after after every all, all the dust settles yeah it's and you know you kind of worry are we sacrificing our most basic uh, civil and human liberties the right to assemble the right to freely express yourself you know over a, a virus that you know what's next year's virus is the kind of the question is is you know there's always a virus there's always a flu there's always some health emergency that can be used as an excuse to curtail our, our basic rights. And so, you know, that's kind of where I'm worried about is that are we actually going too far in saying it's one thing to ask people and which I was actually impressed. I watched Governor Newsom's um, press conference yesterday. We were recording this Sunday afternoon. So I was his Saturday night press conference and I was actually impressed. He didn't, you know, and I don't like to say, I'm not a fan of Governor Newsom. So it's almost like, you know, blasphemy saying this, but, you know, he's doing okay. He didn't actually issue mandates. He issued strong recommendations to stay home. It's the it's these um, mayors that are actually being kind of the authoritarian nightmares, which I suppose in a way is better. But, you know, and then you have this, uh, I guess it's Ohio, where the governor issued the, you know, you can only have two people or five people and to gather together and um, they were sued. He was sued and a judge said, no, as long as he's op operating in good faith, it's okay. And I said, well, I don't know if operating in good faith is allowed to surrender your constitutional rights based upon operating in good faith. I'm not entirely sure that's a valid <laughs> legal argument. 
Yeah, this is going to be challenging times trying to understand what we're going to, you know, what we've given up. I, you know, that's the problem, you know, once the fire starts and everybody's in a panic, uh, you know, rights tend to get trampled. And, and that's, I think, where we're at at the moment. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, some uh, it, people will start getting a sense of, of the cracks in this, uh, you know, system right now and and um, start to be a little more skeptical as we go forward, because right now it doesn't seem like there's a lot of skepticism. It's a lot of it is just do whatever the leader is saying. And, and you know, this could be, a, um, you know, I, I, I think as libertarians, we're already a little bit skeptical of what the leader is saying, but I think the, clearly the majority of the public, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, directly associate with the libertarian party. <laughs> yeah. And well, we've had our societies, all, most of us have been taught to sit down and listen to the person at the front of the room, right? That's kind of what we've been taught since kindergarten, is you sit down and you listen to the, the authority figure. And so it's hard to cycle to break out of. And, you know, at the same time, you don't want to nitpick during a time of emergency. You don't want to sit there and, and be overly uh, uh, critical while someone's trying to do the best they can. You know, you, maybe there's some details that I would have done differently. But now's not the time for arguing with that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried that we're in one of those situations where, you know, epidem uh, ep ep excuse me, um, uh, epi epidem <laughs> epidemiologists. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know why I'm getting so tongue tied right now. Uh, and doctors, their main, uh, their their main focus is to fight the disease. And so I'm sure they're doing everything that seems logical in that sense, but they're also, they're not economists. And, you know, we happen to be moving an awful lot of resources in society to deal with this problem. And, you know, a lot of times it seems like for good policy, you need to have both the economists and the, uh, the, the scientists and doctors working together because uh, the scientists and doctors, they're going to understand uh, they're going to have a good idea of of what's actually occurring physically, but they're not going to really be the experts in what's the most efficient way to shift things around, to shift resources around, and what what are the consequences of making big shifts in resources in society. So, I you know it, I'm a little skeptical of our of our current direction, and I mean you know with Goldman Sachs again saying that we're looking at a 24 percent drop in GDP in quarter two alone, that's just staggering. Uh, the the productivity loss and so you know one of the one of the things I was kind of kicking around as a possible solution is you know everybody's worried about the big spike to the health system but you know we've heard a few uh, sources that have been talking about an alternative I think they said Denmark is experimenting with this and I've heard it on a few other shows but the idea that you <clears throat> you try to quarantine the people who are at risk, you know, give them voluntary uh, instructions to quarantine and then provide your government services to help out in that so that we can, you know, really help those people to avoid uh, the disease and to bring resources to them so that they're not put at risk while the rest of society goes along its business because the majority of people who are at risk are also, you know, not, you know, at least the, the majority of them aren't part of the uh, the main workforce. The main workforce is mostly going to be the younger, healthier people who don't seem to be nearly as at risk from this. I, I think we're looking at, you know, the mortality rates are pretty staggering when you get to around uh, 80 years old. Or I think they can be up to like 15 percent. They've been talking about numbers like that. Whereas, you know, when you start to get you know, when you're around 19, it's almost zero. So, you know, you, and then you have this spectrum in between there. And, and I think you know, they're really talking about people with, uh, you know, complications who are under 50 and, uh, you know, maybe has smokers, asthma, uh, diabetes, things like that might might contribute. But if we could help to protect those people, we could also be productive at the same time and be in a much better position to help them tomorrow. Because what if this uh, epidemic isn't gone in three or four weeks? We, I'm not sure we can afford to just keep the same plan going and having jobs permanently destroyed. So, you know, it just seems to me that might be the longer term, uh, more cautious route to go just to preserve 
uh, preserve our liberty and health for the future as well. Yeah, well, we're all eventually going to get sick. If you it doesn't matter who you talk to, you know, anywhere between a third to eighty percent of us are going to catch this virus. It's just most of us aren't going to have been many symptoms, and so we need to protect those who have who are going to have the hardest symptoms, not those who are going to not you know be fine. You know, it's like me. For all I know, I could have had I, we could have had the virus already around here. Me and my daughter, you know, are out in the public all the time, and so we probably we for all we know we may have spread it around and no one really got sick. And it's hard. It's almost impossible to know. And so, isolating those who are at risk so that though they don't flood the system all at once, which is what the whole point of flattening the curve, that whole marketing issue is, it's just so you don't get so many of that five percent of people who get really sick and need medical care. You don't flood the system all at once. And I think that is kind of what we're what we're looking at and what we're trying to do, and is what we are doing. The best way to accomplish it and i think you're right maybe we're focusing on isolating those people most at risk so the rest of us can kind of get this thing done and over with quickly you know may or may not be a, another option when and the sad thing is i don't think a lot of people see the huge risk on the economic side yet i think maybe people are starting to get a sense of it but if if we were to be dumping a trillion dollars a month into the economy and having these productivity losses at the same time for any length of time we'll be you know in six months we'll be up to greek levels of debt when they were rioting in the streets and i I'm, I'm hoping that we don't get to that point but if if we don't have a plan and if we think we're just going to lock down and keep either printing money or trying to borrow our way out of it, and that's another issue too um if, if we're trying to finance this debt by borrowing there's going to be a lot of other countries in the world as well who are also trying to borrow at the same time. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, you know, it's who's going to be able to finance all that borrowing when everybody's trying to borrow at the same time. So it's, it's one of the things that is very worrying. And, and there, I think there's a lot to be said for trying to keep the healthy people working and productive and also to not, not putting them in a position where, uh, you know, the, the rules don't seem to, you know, a lot of idle hands of, of people who, you know, can't really understand why they're idle. You know, you could see people starting to, you know, uh, turn to crime and other things in order to, uh, you know, finance just basic things like housing and, and food. So that's one of those things that it does worry me. Well, it's not, well, you know, one of the things that's been worrying me is, you know, this isolation, social isolation, the economic devastation is going to be a stress on mental health. And so we've got a lot of people who are kind of on the edge mental health wise anyway. I just read a saw an article just earlier this morning about some 64 year old man jumped out of a 16th floor window in New York because he's been isolated. And so, you know, this is someone who's probably on the edge anyway. And so this has kind of pushed them off. But if we haven't, don't think about that as well, we're not doing our job about thinking about with the whole wider community. Yeah. I, I think you're you're probably a lot of wisdom there. <clears throat> you know, some of the other things that worry me too is as we go out of this, uh, if at some point we, as we start to see the light and start returning to work, um, will we be stymied by things like uh, AB5 that uh, stops people from, you know, just getting gig type jobs in order to get back into the workforce more easily. And uh, that's something that, you know, California has pushed and it's starting to spread to other states. And I think they're considering it nationally. And I, it's hard to cease a policy that could be more disastrous when we want to get people back to work with the least amount of barriers as possible once this is all over. Well, yeah. And the people aren't going to have, as we've talked earlier, you know, money's going to be hard to come by. And so it's going to be coming into a business and going out to your employees. So they're not going to have that kind of resources that these big businesses have to kind of restart. And so you're going to need these gig workers. And right now as delivery workers, you know, as the gig work has kind of dried up, you know, where are you going to get all these flexible workers during this next time? You're going to have to hire a bunch of employees, but in six months or three months when your older employees who have gone home, like at Home Depot, they lost half my daughter at Home Depot. They lost half the workforce because they're all older, elderly. And so, so they're going to, they haven't hired anybody yet, but if they did, what happens when three months, when all those people come back, you've now got too much staff and people are going to have to get let go. Yep. And, and people's, you know, buying habits won't have necessarily returned at the same point. Everybody is going to be a kind of assessing their risk and, and not, not, it won't just be back to a hundred percent right away. Uh, yeah. 
it, it doesn't seem like we're kind of contemplating that. And maybe they are, and they're just kind of focused on the, you know, focus on expressing the, the views of the virus right now. So maybe the R in the back room deals kind of thinking about these kind of things. But I, you know, you have to wonder, is, are they really considering the livelihoods of all these, all these people? Yeah. Well, and it's funny too, because there are some, some booms right now going out there in the economy as well. I mean, I think Amazon announced that it was going to hire like a hundred thousand people, I think. And, and, there's lines of people outside of the gun stores <laughs> as well. So, I mean, these are all, uh, you know, uh, businesses that are, are, you know, having some uptick, I guess, during this. But again, once the crisis uh, is, dies down, then, if, then you would think some of those people are also probably going to be let go at some point because then there won't be as much need in those areas. So it just seems like, uh, you know, in, in the end, you, you really hate to have this kind of chaos in the, economy because it's really hard on everybody <laughs> yeah they're going to hire a bunch of like I'm, i've even applied to some safeway jobs you know like to be a shopper or a delivery driver at safeway but you know what happens in a couple months you know that they keep the good ones but i mean someone's going to have to go you yeah know, last fi last hired first fired type of thing and especially when you're talking union jobs so you know you're getting hired on which is great for the short term but you know is it long term is it kind of a realistic sustainable thing yeah uh, it's uh, certainly a worry. And there's there's, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, uh, laws out there, too, that, you know, maybe throwing a little more chaos into the system. Some of these, you know, every time there's a crisis, it always seems like we always have this uh, uh, cry that uh, price gouging. And, you know, it's one of the things that helps us know when we have, uh, you know, uh, it, those prices are really helping to uh, show us where supply isn't meeting demand and, and where there's a, you know, and so if it's the prices are, are <clears throat> getting higher, it, you know, like if somebody, I, I, there was a story that talked about, I, I can't remember exactly where the restaurant was, but uh, they realized they had some extra boxes of toilet paper and they realized that the, uh, uh, you know, because they were being forced, uh, it was a restaurant, uh, they were being forced not to serve people uh, inside the restaurant so they could only have to go. They thought, well, why don't we, you know, offer to sell some rolls of toilet paper? And so they were offering to sell the toilet paper at $3 a roll. And then somebody complained and the uh, price gouging police came in and told them they couldn't sell any of the toilet paper. So, you know, I guess they're just not selling any of the toilet paper and just sitting on those rolls instead of letting them get out there. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, there's times, you know, there's there's a difference between price gouging and getting rid of supplies that you have for no reason at a willing buyer. There is a difference. I saw a, a solution. I saw oh, one of these European stores is if you bought your first bottle of hand sanitizers was like four ninety five. Your second bottle of hand sanitizer was ninety five dollars or ninety five krona or whatever the heck it was. It's, so so if you want to buy the first one, you could pay a normal price. If you want to buy the second one, you could, but you're going to pay a lot more for it. And so I think that's an actually probably a better way to approach this is, is, you know, okay, you're going to put your buying limit. You can buy whatever you want, but the more you buy, the more you're going to pay. Yeah. 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 I guess that makes some sense. You know, if somebody really wants it a lot more then they can still buy extra at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is about all the time we have for us today, Jason. Thank you for, for calling in and this kind of worked well. And, you know, hopefully we can get back in the studio soon. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, James. I look forward to it. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.